You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by CBOE Live Vol. CBOE Live Vol is the leader in equity and index options trading technology, providing professional and retail traders with the most sophisticated options risk analysis, compliance, and trading tools. CBOE Live Vol offers a broad spectrum of advanced trading technology, including the Live Vol X, next generation execution platform and live vol pro the new standard in options trading front ends visit livevol.com for a 15-day free trial today and by russell investments the home of russell indexes which calculates approximately 700,000 benchmarks daily covering 98 percent of the investable market globally including more than 80 countries and more than 10,000 securities approximately 4.1 trillion dollars in assets are benchmarked to russell indexes for more information on russell indexes and rvx please visit russell.com slash indexes and now, it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again for Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from a little thing we like to call around these parts, the old options insider Radio Network is old, actually. It's coming up on a decade in January, which is crazy uh, to think about. We've been, we've been doing this for nearly 10 years. Crazy cakes. Not Vol Views that whole time, but, but a pretty lengthy time on Vol Views as well. And of course, where can you find all of that 10 years? 10 years. Think of that. 10 years worth of options and derivatives goodness. Well, of course, the easiest place in the whole wide world, the mothership, the flagship, theoptionsinsider.com. While you're there, of course, a lot of great written content up there as well, unusual activity, a lot of that, breaking news from the options market, a lot of that up there as well, education, some analysis, even some future stuff sprinkled up there as well if you are so inclined. So head on over there, find all of that goodness. And, of course, if you just want to stream the audio straight into your veins slash ears, then uh, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Play, iHeartRadio, pretty much wherever you find your favorite podcast, including a bunch of new outlets we are there, including via the app stores on iOS and the Google Play and Amazon Fire app stores. Just search for us, Options Insider, or Options, if you want to go the full search, because I know those app store searches suck, <laughs> then Options Insider Radio Network, and you can't miss us over there. And of course, however you get us via the app, iTunes, website, via Slice Bread and Tin Can, however you do it, we love to hear from you guys, too. So if you have questions about volatility comments, you don't like this, you like that, let us know. Hit us up via social media, twitter.com slash options, or it's all baked into the website or the mobile app, or, of course, just hit us up. If you are one of the few who can join us live every Friday, we stream this show every Friday, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, via Mixler, M-I-X-L-R. So if you are so inclined, you got some time at your desk on a Friday, you want to join us, listen to the show, see how the sausage is made. We'd love to see you in there. And, of course, you can ask your questions live there as well. And of course, all you on-demand folks, we haven't forgotten about you. We love you guys, too. You just send your questions in a little bit after the fact, and we get to them on the next show. And joining me on this show, let's start off, I'm not sure what, what the proximity order is today, because I don't know who's where, so I'm just going to go in order of on my, uh, on my window here, and the first one I see is Mr. Corner Office, a.k.a. Mr. Russell Rhodes, the senior instructor over there in the, in the CBOE 
Options Institute. I hear a little birdie tells me, Mr. Russell, it's, you're, it's a busy day over there. Lots of, lots of edumacating going on at the Institute. We're running dual classes, which is really exciting. We've got a group from the Federal Reserve, from several of the different regional banks here. And then we've got a group that's learning about different income strategies associated with equity options. Income and the Federal Reserve all in one place. How do you do it, sir? Crazy, crazy times. Hopefully you're teaching those Fed people about volatility and all that good stuff, so maybe they can cause a little bit less of it uh, with their various various actions. All right, and also joining me on the program today, not sure where he's joining us from. He is the greasy meatball, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com, as well as, of course, from Carmen Line Capital. Mr. Greasy Meatball, where are you beaming in from today? Is it from the suburbs? Is it from the, uh, the global HQ or from somewhere in between? I am in one of the 10 towns that changed America, beautiful Riverside, Illinois. The 10 towns the, uh, that changed America. The coziest little little town two miles <laughs> from the border of Chicago. The 10 towns that changed America, hopefully for the better. Uh, we'll get into that when we get into our local history section of the show, but now it's time for the volatility review. <laughs> It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the Volatility Review. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Volatility Review. Like the man said, this is the portion of the show where we break down the week that was and indeed still is from a volatility trading and analysis and research perspective. We are streaming this live, like I said, and recording it on Friday, September 16th, right around middle of the session here for all of you playing along after the fact and after a bit of a rally ho yesterday. We're seeing uh, the street give up some of those gains today. Most of the major indices off about half a percent or so. Uh, so a little bit of red across the screen. And surprisingly, of course, some a little bit of red coming off ye old VIX cash as well. It's been an interesting week uh, to watch all things VIX. We're flirting with some interesting high levels earlier this week. Hit about 19, a little over 19, I believe, earlier this week. And now uh, giving off a lot of that, hovering a little bit south, a little bit shy of the 16 handle, right around 15.86 or so. Right now, off about half a handle or so out there in VIX land. We'll see how that holds up as the show progresses. But it has been an interesting week. We were lamenting on recent episodes, not that, not that far back on this show, you know, whither has the vol gone? Where is there any vol to be found? You know, the implied vol was, was negligible. The historical vol was anemic. By, by any comparison, it was about five for the 30-day historical volatility. Uh, now we've seen a little bit of movement. There actually was, I think it was close to a 50-day span where the S&P had to move 1% in, in either direction. So things were just really, uh, to call them the summer doldrums is, is quite apropos, I think. Things were just pretty light and not really much happening at all. We're seeing a little bit of that change this, this week, which is, if you're a listener to this show, you're a little bit active out there, maybe is probably a welcome uh, development for you. Uh, the implied vol are creeping up and the historical vol also creeping up, having more than doubled uh, since our last episode. We're at about an 11 right now on the 30-day historical, which uh, far better than the anemic five uh, we were looking at last week. And so things are, are picking up, a lot of interesting stuff to get to on the activity front and everything else. But before we do that... Uh, let's start off. Let's start off in the land of Carmen Line slash Option Pit. Mr. Greasy Meatball, what's been catching your eye in this week of all things volatility? Well, you know, I think today in particular is interesting in that we've got the market down, you've got VXST down, you've got VIX down. But we've seen v VVIX above 105 and a huge move in VIX skew um, kind of yesterday afternoon or yesterday morning. You'll love this. So uh, I, I, we're not 100% sure, but based on the trade, I'm thinking it was Barclays. Uh, they came in and into the crowd and sized up the, uh, the October 30 calls. And the crowd, I think, was uh, 42.50. And Barclays bought 25,000 for 50 cents. They then immediately bought another 40,000 for 52 electronically, completely running over the crowd. And then uh, upside skew from about the 28 strike to up to the 35 strike in October completely exploded, moving, you know, multiple, multiple points. 
I want to say that uh, that uh, Vol was up at least three points uh, on like the thirty strike. Uh, it was with the futures lower. The bid, was, the the market was uh, fifty fifty five on the so. Uh, needless to say, the market makers probably weren't probably were not pleased with uh, how the broker handled that trade. But uh, you know, just kind of looking at today, you know, feels like this is the the classic. Now that we've run up vol, let's let's dump some ahead of the Fed because we think they're going to do what we expect them to do. There, the the bears are who we thought they were. The Fed is who we thought they are uh, in not raising rates trade, if you will. You know, one of the worst things you could hear as a market maker after you put up a big trade is how are they now? Uh, and uh, even, even worse, even worse is, is when you don't get the how are they now? It just goes up yeah, through you. After and they the just fact. put it up at a better price away from you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, you're right. That is worse because then they don't even get the show or anything of it. It's just like a slap in the face. Uh, but, yeah, you don't like uh, you don't like wearing those those skid marks so early into a trade uh, that that those upside strikes are. You know, we talked about that before on that show, particularly around that 30 handle. Uh, there's just uh, there's a magnetism to that strike. There's a, there's some sort of appeal to it, even. Even back when the futures and the cash were, were significantly lower, there was still sizable activity around that level. So for whatever reason, uh, some research, some algorithm, maybe all of the above, people have fixated uh, to that 30 strike. And they, they refuse to give it up no matter how anemic volatility or, or anything else may be out there, the futures, the cash, what have you. Uh, it's just uh, it's, been, it's been a fascinating thing to watch. And now as volatility getting a little bit of life again, uh, I expect to see those 30s. Uh, come come roaring back to life in terms of uh, the, all the action we see out there on those strikes. Mr. Corner Office, same question for you, sir. What's been what's been catching your eye this week from a volatility perspective? Well, you know, something that's that's catching my eye at this very moment, it answers the age old question or, or dem- demonstrates the age old question that VXX ain't VIX. Uh, VXX is actually up a half a percent right now, with VIX down 2.4 percent. So it's a you know, it, it's a demonstration that that when you VXX, it, it it doesn't necessarily do what VIX does. And since the futures you know are are working their way a little bit higher today, uh, it, it actually gives me it gives me a new illustration of how the when you buy VXX, you're sure as heck not buying VIX. Well, that's a point we've made uh, made frequently here on this program, and uh, we've tried to dissuade people whenever possible from uh, from that use case. We've we've you know we've said it's okay intraday, maybe uh, maybe today being one of those exceptions. Maybe you didn't want to go that route today, uh, but still, yeah, you're right. Interesting stuff, and that's that's kind of been for a long time, and and still is in many regards the the broad retail surrogate for some sort of volatility exposure, and uh, <laughs> and uh, so far at least. It's uh, it's been an interesting interesting thing uh, to watch. Speaking of watching, of course, like we said, VIX Cash uh, ticking up, getting back into the range that those uh, those lofty futures had been predicting for some time. I believe we had a listener question last week uh, about that topic about why uh, the at the monies were were hovering around a nineteen or so level out in the D's time frame. That's because the D's future was out there right around a nineteen to twenty level, uh, and it's still out there as we're speaking, right around a nineteen or so, and uh, the octanove and eighteen and a quarter to about 18 and a half or so. So uh, fairly rich, but then again, we're seeing the cash kind of catch up. You know, a lot of you have been somewhat mystified by the, uh, by the discrepancy being, uh, being uh, displayed out there in terms of the term structure, uh, the futures versus the cash. Maybe the activity uh, of the VIX cash over the past week will seem a little bit less mystifying to you once you spend a little bit of time looking at the term structure. What did we say last week? The answer to all, to all questions and volatility is just look at the VIX futures term structure and, uh, <laughs> and it, will, uh, it will explain all things. Well, hopefully that mystery, uh, mystery coming to light. Mark, you mentioned the VIX. Uh, it is indeed uh, roaring back to life. At least it did earlier this week, kind of, kind of settling off some, uh, some very lofty highs. We were commenting about that on, on recent episodes as well, how it was kind of just languishing there at the bottom end or near to it of that trough, right? Or that bottom floor seemed to have come in around 75 over the last six months to a year, and it was hovering around an 80 to 85, so pretty close uh, to the bottom end of that recent range. And then, of course, with all the activity in the last week or so, uh, it spiked and spiked pretty hard, got up to about, I believe, about 116 
uh, earlier this week, of course, VIX being the volatility of VIX. Uh, so, you know, VIX was rocking and rolling uh, when we see uh, VIX uh, lighting it up this week as well. As we're, t- as we're recording the show here today, VIX uh, coming off a little bit off those, off those fairly lofty highs, right about 106 and a half or so right now. So still very elevated, showing that there is indeed perhaps still some move, some impetus for VIX to run in either direction, to the upside or the downside. Maybe our friends out there on the 30 handle <laughs> thinking it's to the upside. A lot of people were playing in the puts recently over the last couple of weeks, too. Maybe they're leaning downside. We shall see. Uh, speaking of which way we're leaning, let's get into it. Mr. Rhodes, it is time for Russell's Weekly Rundown. Now, Russell's Weekly Rundown. All right, that always puts a smile on my face. Listeners, it is time once again for Mr. Corner Office to regale us with tales of all things VIX weekly options and approximately a 30 to 40 minute segment where he really goes deep into all things VIX options. And I take a, n- a nice little break. So, Mr. Mr. Rhodes, have at it, sir. The floor is yours. The clock is set for 30 minutes. Are you going down to the corner for cigarettes and everything? Yeah, a pack of smokes and perhaps a, uh, a, nice, uh, a nice 40. <clears throat> Classy. Well, you, <laughs> you, uh, you, you narrowed me down to VIX, which is I was going to talk a little, little bit about some of the other, other weeklies markets. This is always a, I think you just, you, you just want to do this so you get to play the music once a week. But There are, um, there are worse reasons next, for the segment, sir. Uh, the uh, the next week is standard September expiration, which uh, means you know that's if if you're thinking short term, uh, you're trading what's already uh, got an awful lot of open interest. Uh, I started to look beyond the September 21st expiration to uh, the September 20. I believe it'll be the 28th, and there ain't nothing going on. So a whole lot of nothing. But I did stretch out to October 5th, and it was kind of interesting. There's a, a There was a, a seller of 800 of the VIX October 5th, 17 calls at 2 bucks today, uh, expecting a, a, a lower, uh, expecting VIX to be at least below 17 uh, a few weeks out. That's an interesting time because it's just before the next employment number. Uh, so it might be, you know, kind of a take that things will be somewhat quiet until we, uh, you know, until we uh, uh, move into the last employment, or yeah, the last employment number before the, the second to last employment number before the election. Uh, it'll also come after. Uh, it comes before pretty much anything serious that may occur in October. So the timing's kind of good for it. Uh, somebody else that that. Not really going out on a limb here, uh, but <laughs> doing an interesting trade with VIX weeklies. Uh, somebody sold 300 of the VIX, the October 5th, 40 strike calls and took in a dime. Uh, you know, I guess I, I, I think it's pretty safe bet to say that we're probably not going to venture above 40, barring any sort of absolutely ridiculously unforeseen uh, activity taking those dimes um, off the table when you can sir yeah yeah the uh and then i saw it i i ventured over into vxx for a few minutes because they've got weeklies that expire next friday uh, a few bearish trades on vxx coming across i'm i i want permission to start talking about vix vxx weekly trades as well go for it you gotta uh, fill because, your 30 minutes somehow so go well for it. because it's uh it it's uh, it actually is is, and I work at CBOE where where I'm supposed to say all things VIX, but um, I do find uh, the VXX, especially when you're trying to take the other side of a move in volatility, uh, makes an awful lot of sense. I saw some put buyers looking out to next week. Uh, somebody buying the 40 strike puts that expire next week, uh, it, which if we just stay in a regular, uh, re- we stay in a regular. Uh, VIX contango type shape, uh, that that probably will work out fairly well because on average we usually get about a five percent move low lower uh, if we don't get any sort of spike in volatility. So that's not I, I thought that was a fairly decent trade as well. Just going out and paying a little over two bucks for the September twenty third forty VXX puts, uh, and then something that I really wanted to talk about, but I'm not seeing anything good today so far. The um, the Monday weeklies that we have on SPX, I'd seen some really nice credit spreads go up the last two Fridays. 
uh, that, that had an awful lot of cushion not to uh, not to lose on the trades uh, early on Fridays that expired the following Monday. Haven't come across any good ones today, unfortunately. Uh, I figured that would be an easy one to find something to talk about. But uh, Monday weekly's volume is is pretty light compared to what we've seen the past few weeks. In that we've been seeing like thirty, forty thousand contracts, and it's it's closer to maybe eight thousand today. So, yeah, it has been a fascinating week to watch from a from a volatility perspective and just from an activity uh, perspective. We're seeing a lot of things lighting it up. In fact, this being one of the more active weeks we've seen in in quite some time here. Uh, from a VIX options perspective, of course, the end of last week was also uh, fairly active as well. Uh, but we're seeing a, a lot of paper lighting it up today. It's still averaging out there about a little under, a little shy of 600,000 contracts a day out there in the VIX mothership options. Putting up already today, about halfway through the session, about a little over 300,000. Looks like looks like they're on par to uh, to hit their number uh, today. But earlier in the week, things were really lighting it up. Yesterday, also a very active day. So Thursday, about 700, nearly 800,000 uh, contracts going up. But it seems like uh, Monday through Wednesday was where a lot of the action was. And I know, Mr. Rhodes, you like to you like to head on down to uh, to the VIX pit every now and then. I'd imagine maybe you did you venture down there on Tuesday because there was a it was one of the busier days we've seen in some time. One point three million contracts going up uh, this Tuesday, including what looks like the pier, appears to be the resurgence uh, of our old one by two friend. Uh, apparently, rolling this time from SEP. Uh, out to Nove, we saw a ton, like I said, 1.3 million contracts going up on Tuesday alone. So about 2x uh, your ADV going up in one day, 60,000 going up just in one leg on the Nove side of this uh, one by two. This time, it looks like it was rolling from the SEP 1722. Remember, this paper usually is a short one and then long two. So then closing that out and rolling it to uh, the next month. Uh, where it would be in SEP. Looks like they chose the SEP, excuse me, Nov 17. Uh, 23, that went up about 60,000 times, 20,000 by 40,000 uh, on Thursday with other size coming in and different uh, size also on SEP. A lot of 10,000 lots uh, lighting it up. And again, just aggregate. Uh, this is uh, this this trade is kind of, if you want to pick a, I guess, a net narrative for uh, the past year or so out there in, in VIX land, I, I, I can't think of another strategy that has been as aped as this one. If this isn't, this isn't our one by two friends, someone else is, likes to put it on uh, for size. We've seen this going up in pretty much every month uh, in just about every, every type of strike with imaginable, uh, the one by two, short one, long two. Clearly, clearly the VIX trade du jour. I don't know, Mr. Rhodes, I know you've been busy edumacating over there uh, in the Institute. Do you have a chance to uh, meander down to the VIX pit on Tuesday and see uh, see what was up with all these all these one by twos and other paper going up that day? I, I tried to go down there a couple of times and they told me to get the hell out of there. <laughs> That's often the response when they see you coming, isn't it? I'm actually I'm actually serious. They uh, they I went down to ask a couple of questions and they really were too busy to uh, to deal with me. And then I was on the road for work uh, the last two days. So I hadn't had a chance to go visit with them. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have pit insights. Uh, I do know that the, the September that got rolled out to November, uh, sometimes they go one month and sometimes they go two months. I, I, I can't figure out what dictates uh, the decision there. You know, maybe it's the electoral cycle this time. Uh, but they, they, I found no rhyme or reason with the year or so that they've been rolling this out as to whether they go out one month or two months but of course we've only got a handful of of rolling transactions to uh, to work with to try and back into that one yeah clearly it's uh, it's dictated again the answer to all things the VIX futures term structure and apparently how that one lines up because you're right sometimes they use they typically roll about one month but every once in a while we see them uh, gapping out a few uh, and clearly uh, clearly playing around with things a little bit this time but you know it's hard to argue with a strategy that for the most part, has has worked fairly well. I mean, we can highlight a few periods. Obviously, it's not a, there is no silver bullet to trade all things VIX perfectly every time. But uh, this one, in a lot of different scenarios over the past year, has performed fairly well, including, of course, 
uh, this time last year when uh, post August 24th when VIX shot up and uh, we saw this uh, strategy really really knock it out of the park and as you said many times uh, with VIX it, it is very much a table stakes management type game you want to stay in the game long enough until you hit these home run spikes uh, this past week wasn't a home run spike, but it was an aggressive upside move. Uh, so if you had one of these on, you probably were, were uh, depending on your strike selection, you probably were a happy camper. Uh, so uh, this type of trade does help you manage those table stakes until you hopefully you can get in there for the big home run swing when, when VIX really does its thing and outperforms to uh, the upside. So a very, very active week this week, about nearly a million contracts going up on Monday as well. It's coming on the heels of last week. On Friday, it was about 1.2 million as well. So after a very extensive period of not a heck of a lot going on, uh, VIX is suddenly lighting it up. I'm not surprised to hear they, they shooed you out of the pit, Mr. Rhodes, because they were probably surprised. They're like, oh, we got, we got stuff to do finally. We, <laughs> we, we don't have time to chat anymore. Uh, we chatted all summer, but now we're actually trading. And so uh, I'm sure they were, they were pretty enthused at, at the prospect, looking at the hot strikes for the past uh, week, the top 10 strikes out there in VIX land. Uh, number one, uh, even though you're talking the 30s out in Ock, uh, Mr. Greasy Meatball, uh, they're on there, but they're a wee bit lower. Uh, things are all pretty pretty tight, pretty close uh, this uh, week, which is kind of interesting. Usually you don't. See, usually we see a pretty big discrepancy between number one and number two, sometimes two, three hundred thousand plus contracts. This time, uh, not so much. Everything's fairly, uh, fairly tight. Number one, the SEP 25s with about 237,000 contracts open. Uh, so actually fairly light compared to what we've seen in the past two. Usually number one is somewhere around the 350 to 400,000 contracts open range. Not so much this week, again, reflecting uh, perhaps a uh, disparity of opinion. Not everyone's in love with the 30 strike. Uh, number two, the 19s, the far more optimistic, uh, the far more realistic, I should, I should say. Uh, 19s in SEP with about 230,000 contracts, followed by the SEP 22s. That whole strip, the SEP 19 to 22 kind of range, is pretty active with about 227 to 224,000 there at number four. Number five, the first puts on the list, the SEP 13s with about 217,000 contracts open. Then we go back uh, to pretty much all calls all the time until the end, the SEP 20s. And 30s with about 212,000, 213,000 each, respectively. The number eight, the uh, excuse me, that was the OC 30s. Uh, that was the OC 30s, number seven. So, Mr. Sebastian's favorite strike, lighting it up to the tune of about 212,000 contracts. Uh, the OC 20s coming in after that, 185,000. Then the SEP 18s, 171,000, all the way at the bottom of the list, but not, not that light on the volume perspective. The SEP 15 puts, remember, we were talking. A lot of put spreads over the past couple of weeks. There was 14, 13, 15 was also there as well. 15, 14, 15, 13. A lot of different variations of those strike flavors. Uh, the 15s out there in SEP still fairly active, about 170,000 uh, contracts open out there. Total of a little over 8 million contracts open. Again, reflecting uh, a busy period. That's a fairly high number for our VIX open interest. About 5.6 on the calls and about uh, 2.4 or so on the puts. Let's turn our attention uh, quickly here to uh, the commodity side as well. All things crude have been, and all things commodity in general, have been kind of fun to watch. Uh, you know, we've been, we've been talking a lot about uh, crude volatility, and we look at it a lot by a by SIBO's own VIXs out there for the sticky stuff, uh, and uh, OIV, OVX, of course, being the uh, the VIXs for WTI and USO, respectively, both hovering around a 40 right now. They're uh, retreating off of their recent high. They spiked up about a week or so ago to about the 46 or so level. All of that is still elevated from where they were hovering not that long ago, about a week to two weeks ago, where they were hovering in the mid to low 30 range, they got down to about 33 or so. Uh, again, reflecting not a heck of a lot going on from a vol perspective out there in WTI. Then it lit up again this week uh, and USO, and now kind of retreating a little bit again, kind of reflecting that push-pull we're seeing out there in the underlying. Whenever crude tends to retreat down to the downside, those puts are typically more rich from a vol skew perspective. So we see vol kind of creep up. When, the, when WTI rallies, we see vol kind of come off. Now we're seeing a little bit of that. So level eight, we'll see who wins the week out here from a, uh, from a commodity, from a, crude, <laughs> from a crude interest perspective here in the futures. And really quickly on the gold front as well, I just came back from the big, big uh, precious metals dinner that the CME folks have out there in New York. I never, never actually attended that before. It was surprisingly, uh, surprisingly well attended. I had no idea the... The gold and precious metals trading crowd in New York 
was so sizable, apparently maybe speaking to the, uh, to the fact that gold is hot right now and commodities are hot right now. Everyone and their mother wants to learn about and sling some gold. And gold's been uh, kind of quiet of late after having a very active period post-Brexit, of course. Uh, the gold skew has been one of the more fascinating. If you want to see a product with exhibiting evolution of volatility skew, then look no farther than gold in the post-Brexit period and kind of see how it just got super bit up post-Brexit. Of course, everyone flying into gold, gobbling up those calls, and the puts kind of came back to life and balanced things out again, and the calls took the reins again, and it's been a little bit of a back and forth out there. It's been very interesting to watch, certainly more so than, let's say, a spy, <laughs> where, uh, where this, the, uh, the slope is all, the, the skew is always the same. It's just the, the question of slope. Uh, we don't see that out there in the commodities. They kind of move around quite a bit. It's, a little, it's fascinating. If you want to see how skew really impacts how, how options trade and perform, uh, the commodities are the place to look. By the way, if you're interested in that, of course, Come back 3 p.m. Central here to join us for TWIFO, where we go deep into all things uh, commodity vol skew. But that said, gold vol cooling off a little bit after it has been rocking and rolling. Uh, the 30-day uh, implied vol, about a 15%. Uh, it's, it's off its recent uh, recent levels, only about the 23rd percentile right now. That's out there in GLD. I know a lot of you guys like GLD. So we'll look at the, we'll look at the ETF route for uh, this time. Uh, the historical vol also in GLD, fairly low, near the bottom of its 52-week range, hovering south of 11%, again, reflecting the fact that gold quieting off a little bit, maybe waiting to see what the, what the Fed's going to be up to here. Uh, market already pricing in some Fed actions here in gold, so maybe uh, gold kind of in for a bit of a uh, quiet or perhaps even a downside period. We'll see. That said, Mr. Greasy Meatball, Mr. Rhodes, anything catching your eye out there in the commodity vol landscape this week before we dive into some listener feedback? Uh, I will say that uh, I think bond vol has, has finally started to move a little bit, uh, as it should have. Uh, we finally saw the 10-year really have kind of a nasty move in the last week in change. You know, that's really where I think the underlying sell-off has come from has been that, you know, the S&P has had to adjust the fact that the 10-year note yield went from 1.4 to 1.7. Uh, so we've seen a nice little increase in, like, VXTLT and in TYVIX and, and some of those names. Um, oil vol is up. Uh, oil is definitely under some pressure. And I've been watching that oil skew move. And then, um, you know, aside from that, it's been all VIX skew all the time. So those are uh, that's kind of where I'm seeing some of that commodity stuff move around. But you, Mr. Rhodes, you watching anything uh, commodity vol related or are you all things VIX all the time these days? I'm not all things VIX all the time. The um, the one thing is, you know, we tend to talk a lot about the, the skew with respect to USO and GLD. And it really had been, especially with USO, uh, the angle was pretty steep going to the downside. And that seems to have flattened out some. So, you know, maybe the risk perception is uh not as directional as it had been in the past, which means that maybe whoever they are are more concerned about a move to the upside than to the downside. That's the fun thing about all things uh, commodity volatility is that uh, you see such evolutions uh, in skew and in the outlook. It's been kind of fun to watch. You know, I, not that I don't, not that I don't like all things S and P volatility, but uh, that investment skew. Nice to see. Take a break from that every now and then. And look at some other products. I think all the people who've been writing into us of late who have become fascinated with crude and gold and everything else. Uh, all you guys are having a nice little education yourselves as well. It's kind of been been fun to watch. Speaking of you guys writing into us, it's time to get to it. Let's get into our. Volatility voicemail. It's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders. It's time to check the volatility voicemail. Make your voice heard by dialing 779 669 4 VOL, posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, right. or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options or facebook.com slash the options insider. All right, everybody, we've been a little bit remiss of late in, in getting to your questions, so we'll see if we can give you a little bit extra time on the show to, to pile into some. You guys know how to hit us up by now, of course. The Mothership has all those outlets available there, including the website feedback form. A lot of you guys like to use that as well. That's at theoptionsinsider.com. Or hit us up via Twitter, at Options, Facebook, The Options Insider, all those good outlets. Or, of course, 
email questions at theoptionsinsider.com. Or, of course, if you can join us live, uh, you can hit us up there as well. I know a lot of you also like to stream and then hit us up via Twitter. We can do that, but uh, it gets a little more convoluted in that sense. We have to make sure we find it in time. Uh, all right, we got a bunch to get to. Let's see how many we can hit up here. Let's start with um, this one here from Eric. Eric Leland, uh, he's got a timely comment. He says, I saw VIX 1x2s going up this week. Is it that season again? I guess he has a bit of a point there is. I mean, these are, these are very frequent trades. They go up all the time. But there certainly is a, a seasonality, at least to their when they hit the home runs. They, like I mentioned earlier in the show, they this strategy certainly hit a home run this time last year. Uh, so maybe he's thinking of it uh, from that context. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if it's the season or just uh, they're, they're just going up. They go up all the time, even when it's not our, our size one by two friend out there, who I believe is a woman, which uh, speaks a lot to the uh, the egalitarian nature of trading. <laughs> but uh, the uh, even if it's not the, the the progenitor of this strategy, we see a lot of people out there aping it in a lot smaller size, couple of hundred by 500 or so, or a thousand by 2000 or, you know, 3000 by 6000, something along those lines. We see if there's, you know, if there's one strategy we can reliably count on to see every week. Uh, it is this, which is kind of interesting. Also interesting to think about, too, you know, you mentioned uh, the locals not being too uh, enthused to see you, Mr. Rock Lobster, but they're not idiots. Uh, not Mr. Rock Lobster, Mr. Corner Office. Uh, they're not idiots. You know, they know when there's, uh, when there's a reliable bit of paper to come in, uh, they, uh, they're going to fade it, and they're going to fade it pretty hard. So it's got to kind of be challenging, I'd imagine, for this, uh, this uh, person who executes this strategy on so much size to to uh, continue to do it successfully month over month and quarter over quarter when you, they know you're coming and they're pricing it in and starting to, uh, to fade you uh, fairly aggressively uh, here on, uh, on the old thing. So yeah, I guess long answer, <laughs> is it that season? Maybe, maybe, maybe beginning of Q3 is one by two season because that's certainly when it's worked. It did all right this week as well. So it certainly has worked that time. It goes up throughout the year, but in, in recent last couple of years, this has certainly been the time when um, one by twos have, uh, have worked fairly well. Mr. Rhodes, what say you to our friend here, who Eric wants to know, is it one by two season? Is it one by two season? Uh, you know, the rolling for this trade usually occurs uh, very close to uh, usually the week before the next month's expiration. So I think you know there's usually an anticipation that that may happen. But what we um, you know what we may be backing into with what we talked about before, and then and then this question is that may be one of the things, and I think Mark Sebastian touched on it as well, that might be one of the things that actually dictates whether they go for the next month or two months out. Uh, the timing of the roll is usually pretty typical. Uh, the, the, the expiration has varied somewhat, and it probably, maybe it has to do with uh, where they're going to get the better price relative to the anticipation of the crowd. Yeah, Russell, uh, when I look, I, uh, the two things that when I price these things out are one, you know, how much is the cost? How far away do I, am I from kind of where the cash fix is and where the uh, the underlying future is trading? And to, and really, VVIX and Contango determine whether and the, the, the steepness of Contango end up really determining whether you go to one month or two months, uh, you end up going two months a lot when uh, there's a big, big drop off from um, when when kind of that front month gets overpriced. When there's a really, really steep, steep spread between cash and the front month future, that second month future ends up being kind of the, the go to for a lot of these guys. Plus, it typically has lower volatility and where these guys are pricing things. You know, you're putting on these one by twos for like big systemic events that last 60 days, not for these little blips that maybe last a week. And and that's why they're able to, to kind of split the difference between whether they do one month or two months. All right. Next up, we got um, what do we got here? We got a question from Jay Javak. He or she writing. Uh, <laughs> what about a mini VIX option? I, uh, <laughs> people have had minis on the brain. Lately, on some of our other shows, uh, writing in, uh, <laughs> writing in uh, with this stuff. This is kind of uh, the minis where we talked about those before. Uh, they are a much lamented uh, product of the past. 
they they never launched with a VIX, I don't believe. They had, I think, GLD and Apple and a bunch of other things on there. There never was a mini. It would be kind of weird when, when VIX usually is in the uh, low teens to 20-odd, 30 range to, to put a mini out there. <laughs> but uh, it would be weird. Like that said, I don't think we're going to see it. Uh, because minis, as we said, uh, unfortunately have gone the way of the Dodo. Uh, they seem to have been usurped these days by more short-duration contracts, the weeklies, and in the case of the SIBOs, the, the forthcoming dailies, uh, where people seem to flock into those. Those are cheaper, more bite-sized. They, they tend to accomplish a lot of the same thing in terms of reducing premium outlay and things like that. So those succeeded where the minis have failed. I, uh, I, why that is is a much longer debate than we have time for here on the show. But I don't think we're going to see a mini anytime soon. Mark, I, I see you You want the opposite. You want a, a VIX Maxi, if that's the proper term. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it would make sense to, to come up with something that maybe matches the size of the future. They're never going to do that. But, uh, you know, I, I think if you asked institutions what they'd rather have, something that went one for one with the future or a mini, uh, the answer is the, the, the former, not the latter. Uh, but, you know, because a, a big option like that would be much easier to match up against some sort of variant swap. But uh, that said, you're never going to see either. Yeah, we're not going to see a uh, <laughs> not going to see a, uh, a mini uh, a mini VIX in our lifetimes. Uh, unfortunately, the mini mini craze has come and gone, and we we debated that many times. Let's see. Uh, TC TC has a question. He says the U.S. has VIX, Europe has V stocks. Uh, what's the Asian equivalent? Is it the Nifty VIX? <laughs> it hardly seems comparable. Is there a Chinese or Japanese vol product? The Nifty VIX, also aka the India VIX, is one of the few international uh, VIX variants that actually trades. Does some uh, does some uh, does some paper out there? So that's one of the few ones we can point to. Uh, that said, it's not really uh, doesn't really focus particularly on that Asian area. You know, there's that there's that Indian flavor to it, which is a little bit different, obviously, than Japan or China or Singapore type uh, type region. I don't know, Mister uh, Mister Rhodes, you guys are always out there beating the drums for different uh, different flavors of VIX and different uh, uh, equivalents out there and, and signing deals with various exchanges. You had your first Asian RMC uh, not that long ago out there, so obviously Asia an area of interest for you guys. Uh, what is uh, anything on the docket there, anything you're working on or anything you can think of to recommend to our friend here, TC, who is looking to get himself some, uh, some Asia VIX on? Well, um, we're, we're members of something that Standard & Poor's runs called the VIX Network, and they do have a website where they list all of the different uh, broad-based indexes in the world that use the – the broad-based volatility indexes that use our methodology, and in Asia, you've got the ASX 200 VIX, which is a which is Australia, uh, the NSE National Stock Exchange of India, the India VIX, which you just mentioned. Uh, there is a Hang Seng HSI volatility index that does have listed futures on it. Um, that that so that one is available as well, and then there's also a Taiwan Futures Exchange implied volatility index uh i'm gonna when when i hit mute i'm actually gonna put the uh the link to this list out on my on my twitter and you can retweet it as well but they're they're out there i mean we've got uh, a couple dozen volatility indexes uh, around the world that are using the vix methodology uh v stocks is most definitely probably the second most actively traded one though yeah, that one does some paper. It's it's a far cry from what we were just talking about in, in VIX land. Uh, it's it's you know, but it, in terms of uh, in terms of second place, I guess that goes to that. Even though it is a a very distant second place, it'd be like Michael Phelps and then uh, some little toddler rolling in for number two if he was the only other guy in the pool. Uh, let's see uh, what else we got here. Oh, um. C- Cor- Corvette, Seabort, Seabort three. <laughs> uh, he or perhaps she says. Uh, he sends us a link to an article and says this is from ETF Daily News. Came out actually it came out today, so it's timely. Uh, and he writes, "This guy says you should ignore the VIX. Agree? Uh, please discuss on volatility views." And what he links to was an article over here on a site called ETF Daily News. Uh, and it, the headline is, "Here's why investors should ignore uh, the VIX." And uh, he goes on to list. Uh, some interesting ways, arguably the most overanalyzed tool on Wall Street, uh, blah, 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 a bunch of reasons. 
We'll include the link in the in the show notes, listeners, for you guys to follow along with yourself. But and you know, I do we agree with this? So I'm gonna let everybody else chime in for themselves. But it might surprise you guys to say, yeah, we collectively on this show, you know, look what we do here. <laughs> look what we do on this show. We spend a full hour doing a deep dive into all things Vix related here on the program because that's kind of what it takes to really understand the full uh, the full breadth of what's going on here. When you see it quoted in these kind of soundbite snippets of here's where Vix Cash is. You know, we start the show with that, but then we, we go a lot deeper as the show progresses. And that's kind of what it takes. So in in broad strokes, I, I do agree with him. It is kind of overquoted because they don't get into what we uh, what we often broadly refer to here on this program as kind of the context of volatility, the context of VIX. That VIX cash number that you bandy out right now, I can tell you, okay, VIX cash about a 1620 what does that mean in and of itself? And the answer is nothing. I think that's what I haven't had a chance to read the full article here, but I do believe that's what this this author is alluding to uh, as well. In fact, I, I do believe he even uses that same term, uh, context of volatility in here. So in that sense, I do uh, somewhat agree with this author in and of itself. Uh, all these outlets that are just spewing VIX cash, VIX cash, VIX cash without any of the other details that we go into on a program like this, things like the VIX futures term structure, things like VVIX, things like what's going on in the options flow, et cetera. There's a lot of different ways you can go with it. Uh, without all of those things, as well as, of course, what's going on in the broad market where the S&P is, that, of course, translates uh, to what that VIX cash means. Uh, a lot of different things have to be kind of factored into that equation in order to make that number uh, have some sort of meaning. And in, in and of itself, uh, when it's just bandied about VIX Cash 16. That, I, I agree with this guy. It's not really that useful and perhaps probably overdone. And it's, it's, the reasons are many. We talked about them before on the show. It's a sexy thing to call it the fear index and everything else. And it's got this kind of cool uh, cachet to it that people tend to gather around. So I understand why outlets do it. But in and of itself, when it's just thrown up there as a quote next to the Dow, you know, next to S&P, and then you see gold, and then maybe you see VIX thrown up there. In and of itself, that kind of use case it is fairly meaningless. But when when you get a little bit of a deep dive into it like we tend to do here and is kind of required to really understand what's going on behind that number, uh, then I think it has a lot more uh, utility. Uh, I don't know, Mark or uh, Mark or Russell, anything you want to add here? Did you guys have a chance to look at this link? And what do you think about this guy saying investors should ignore the VIX? Uh, well, I don't, I don't think investors should necessarily ignore the VIX, but you don't want to look at it in a vacuum. You want to look at it relative to uh, where it's been as of late, what kind of market environment we're in, and, and then most definitely relative to where the front month futures are. Right now, you know, be looking at, at what the SEP and OC futures are doing relative to the index. And then and, you know, a, a very popular thing that's been around for some time is taking a look at it relative to the three-month version of VIX or VXV. So I, I, I don't think looking at it by itself makes sense, but that doesn't mean that you should discount it all across the board. You just want to make sure that you're looking at it in the context of other things that are going on at the same time. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, well said, well said, sir. So, yeah, we definitely, if you take the context into consideration, then VIX is extremely useful. If you just kind of uh, blurt it out there, then uh, not so much. I think that's what that guy is trying to get to. Again, I didn't read the whole article, but I think that's what it's, he's trying uh, to get to as well. Let's see if we've got time. See if we have a short one. <laughs> Here's a good short one. <laughs> A uh, really quick one from uh, Think Tank, Think Tank Trading. He wants to know, Rose Russell, why did you block him? He wrote to our show to ask us that. <laughs> On wh what? What is he talking about? So why did you block this poor fellow? He just wants to be your friend. Uh, I work for an exchange, and what I do in social media is monitored by the exchange. Therefore... Um, I, it's there's a relatively tight leash with respect to uh, how I interact with people via Twitter. I'm I'm much better at, at interacting via one-on-one uh, -on -one communication, even direct messages on Twitter. But if uh, if, if somebody pushes a button that the exchange doesn't like, uh, I I get a little note that says uh, please block them. My block list is like 300 people long, and I don't have a whole lot of control over that. Um, so that's the it's I, I find it 
And, and, and that's not, I, I get a, an email or a message like that about once a week. Why, what did I do? Well, I, I don't even really remember. Um, <laughs> it's just, uh, because it, because what I do is actually monitored and dictated by other people, uh, which I think if you think about where I work, yeah, I think everybody would, would understand that. Uh, typically if I get an email from somebody and they say, what did I do? I'll just take them off the block list and hope they don't do something again to get me in trouble Sibo <laughs> wields the ban hammer mightily uh hashtag no crazies for uh for russell Rhodes over there all right everybody great questions that's about all the time we got for uh, your questions this week let's keep on rolling into our final segment the crystal ball it's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store it's time to look into the crystal ball all right, everybody, welcome to the Crystal Ball, indeed the portion of the show where we go out on a limb, put our reputations, nay, our names, our very, our very souls on the line in an attempt to uh, try to predict the vicarious beast <laughs> known as Vix. And uh, what, a, what, a, what a vicarious, what a whimsical, what a just sometimes bizarre creature Vix is, of course, we're trying to predict where it's going to be right at this point. Next week, right at right about the end of the show, we're coming up to it. It's right about almost 1 p.m. Central, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern here, listeners. And as we're recording this right now, VIX Cash hovering south of the 16 half level, right around 16.35 or so. And uh, none of us, with the exception of Russell, was really feeling this uh, this elevated VIX love last week. I was I was feeling less to the tune of about a 14 half or so. So. Roughly two handles lower than where we are right now. Uh, Mr. Grease Meatball was was even fading me to the downside. He was down about a 13 levels. So he thought this little blip in vol was going to be very short-lived. And the only one who was feeling his oats from a vol perspective was Mr. Rhodes with about 17. So net movement perspective, you were the winner Price is right rules. I guess I won, even though that's, I won't take that victory because I, I prefer the net uh, the net distance. Uh, Price is right rules are, are silly. We're not trying to win a, a fridge, even though maybe we should have that as a prize. Uh, but that said, Mr. Rhodes, I will, I will, I will concede the victory to you, sir. Uh, what would you like to do with your prize? Would you like to go first, or perhaps name another honorary person to go in your place? So um, I was going to say I was going to go with what I said that you didn't hear because I mis misused the mute button. Um, I, I got to run into the classroom, so I'm going first, and I'm going to say 1650. I think uh, I think we're going to be on edge for almost the rest of the year. So I think uh, uh, I, I think current levels plus a little bit will work out in my favor as a uh, prognostication. And if you have to run into the classroom, you can do your uh, your plug on what's coming up in the land of all things uh, SIBO right now, if you like. Uh, everything is coming up. Well, next month we're doing something uh, where I'm going to do a 45-minute thing at the exchange on VIX, and then we're going to have a handful of managers in, uh, including one of the Thompson twins, to talk about how they use VIX in, um, in their various strategies. Um, what else is going on? And then a week from tomorrow, I board a plane and fly overnight to Ireland because our risk management, the CBOE fifth annual European version of the risk management conference will be going on uh, outside of Dublin in um, at the Powers Court Hotel Resort and Spa, named the top resort spa in Ireland by Resort Spa Magazine for 2016. Yeah, I'm sorry I won't get a chance to make it out there uh, to the Risk Management Conference. If you are in the area, listeners, or you're intrigued, to head on over to the search for CBOE RMC, and you'll find uh, the link to it. Go forth and educate, sir. Go forth and teach those, uh, those Fed people how that vol thing works. So hopefully they, uh, next time they cause a big turmoil in the marketplace, uh, they will understand the implications uh, of their actions, hopefully. That's a big responsibility we have placed on you. Go forth and make us proud, sir. All right, it's time for more vol, vol picking. I'll let Mr. Greasy Meatball uh, think about it a little bit more. Russell went 16 half. We're a little bit shy of that right now. I, I know he's feeling a little bit elevation, and who you know we do have Fed coming up, so that could give us a bolt of juice. But I'm still going to fade. I'm going to be the fader here, and I'm going to go back, uh, back to the dark side, but not not as aggressively as last week. I'll I'll cut it a little bit. I will say. 15, right around the 15 handle for this time 
next week. That means the ball falls to you, Mr. Greasy Meatball. Whither shall you go? Are you going to go way high? Are you going to go north of Mr. Uh, Mr. Rhodes? Are you going to go to the even farther to the dark side than me? What, what are you feeling in your bones for next week? I was literally about to say 15 when you, uh, when you uh, <laughs> stepped in front of me. That's why it's fun to go so, first. Um, and, and part of that is the fact that there's huge open interest on the 15 puts, and there's been heavy buying there. Um, all right, so uh, Russell took 17. You've got 15. I'll split the difference and say 16. Russell actually took 16 and a half, but I will give you, I will give you 16. Right, I'll take 1575 then. Okay, 15. So I've got to get your distance. Got to get your distance from all things uh, corner office. And speaking of distance, got to put some distance between us and this program. It's time for us to sign off. But before we go, we'll check back in with each of our cohorts. We already heard from Mr. Rhodes. Check him out. CBOE Risk Management Conference. And, of course, this program brought to you by our friends over there at CBOE Live Vol. If you haven't checked them out in a while, head on over to LiveVol.com or LiveVolPro.com. Also great places to check it out or look for the data shop. We've often said before on this show, it's always hard to find custom bespoke data sets for your particular unique needs maybe you just want vix from a certain area you want to analyze your one by twos and back test them uh, they can carve that out for you just head on over to their data shop to learn more before we go mr greasy meatball what's cooking in the land of option pit and carmen line you know uh, next saturday starting at 8 30 eastern time 8 30 a.m eastern time we're actually doing a, a discussion on daily options. Uh, you know, it's Andrew's mind, and I know that you agree with us, Mark, that uh, we're going to be dealing with options expiring every day in the SPX by next year, and that will eventually bleed into the equities. And so uh, we want to get out ahead of it and start looking at how one can trade when there's options expiring every day, when expiration, when every day is expiration. Uh, it's going to be uh, this Saturday, uh, Saturday the 24th. Go to optionpit.com slash daily, D-A-I-L-Y, daily. There you go, listeners, optionpit.com slash daily. Mark sounds a little a little wind-draggled. He's hanging out on the porch doing the country thing uh, today, which is why he, it, it's so windy out there. It's called Riverside. It should be called Windy Side. Very, very gusty out there. We'll see if we can get him indoors <laughs> for, for next week. But check it out, optionpit.com slash daily and on behalf of the greasy meatball and mr rhodes who had to go educate the fed folks and indeed myself i want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the show and of course for sending in such great questions hopefully we got to a bunch on this week we'll try to get to more on every episode people are always asking us hey what about our questions so we'll try to get to more don't worry maybe we'll do all questions episode one of these days that'll be kind of fun too and we'll see you next week for more volatility views Thank you for listening to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. For episode archives and detailed show notes, please visit theoptionsinsider.com slash volatility views. Be sure to make your own voice heard by leaving a volatility voicemail at 773-669-4VOL or by posting a comment on theoptionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at theoptionsinsider.com, or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options, or facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider. Volatility Views is brought to you by Russell Investments, a global asset manager and one of only a few firms that offer actively managed multi-asset portfolios and services that include advice, investments, and implementation. For more information on Russell Indexes and RVX, please visit russell.com slash indexes.
The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com. 